and uh, Nick Hill. Uh, thank you very much, James. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this conference. I, um, I don't think right angles uh, should be taught through dance. And I've also seen the fourth season of The Wire, which exposes the very low expectations of the Baltimore uh, education system. Conservatives are often uh, accused of harking back to a golden age uh, in education, located somewhere between 1950 and 1965. I don't believe there ever was such an age. Uh, in that period, those lucky enough to go to one of the 1200 grammar schools would, generally speaking, have had a, a first class education. Um, but those attending one of the 3,700 secondary models were less likely to have had such an advantage. And the question I ask, though, is notwithstanding those concerns, has our education system uh, uh, improved since that time? Undoubtedly, more school leavers are receiving more qualifications and more are going to university. But are they better educated? Universities, as we've just heard, including Oxford and Cambridge, are complaining that too many of their undergraduates are less well prepared than they were in the past. A 2009 three year survey of 284 history and economics undergraduates at Cardiff University, for example, uh, revealed that 88% could not name a single 19th century prime minister, so not Gladstone, not Israeli, not Peel. Employers from Terry Leahy uh, through to the CBI are complaining that the maths and English skills of school leaders are woeful. So this problem isn't confined to the elite going to the elite universities. It's a problem right across the education system. Lord Adonis in his book, Education, 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 is very critical in fact, astonishingly critical, and I read it, I was quite astounded by the level of his criticism, of the standard comprehensive school in this country, where he writes, uh, leadership, ethos, discipline, the qualification of teachers, and the quality of teaching were often pitiful, he writes. And he attributes this to the fact that the most comprehensives were, and I quote, essentially a continuation of their predecessor secondary model school, with problems uh, exacerbated in many comprehensives by a hard left ideological hostility to ability setting. And on top of this, uh, there is the ideological opposition to a knowledge based curriculum, which many educationists argue is grad grinding and simply rote learning. They advocate instead a skills based approach, which they say is more sophisticated and more interesting to young people. But I believe that such changes have been at the expense of huge swathes of important knowledge being lost. A constituent recently sent me some 1909 Oxford local examinations for school leaders. And the geography paper, for instance, asks on the accompanying map, mark Dungeness, Furness, Lewis, the Orkney Isles, uh, Dingle Bay, mark the rivers of Wye, Yar, Tweed, Spay, mark the Cotswolds, mark Dart Dartmoor, Mark the towns of Greenwich, Hereford, Manchester, Carlisle, London, Derry, Limerick, or, uh, Ireland was part of the uh, UK, and uh, Waterford. Number the parallel of 54 degrees north latitude and meridian of 6 degrees west long. Another question asked the candidate to draw a sketch map showing the, the position of New York, showing the mouth of the Hudson River, Long Island, Long Island Sound, Sandy Hook, and the state of New Jersey. And of course, these questions would not have been predictable. There would not have been courses run by uh, exam boards giving very large hints about what elements of the geography and history curriculum would be examined. In history, the paper asks open-ended questions such as, give some account of the relations between England and Spain in the reign of Mary and the reigns of Mary and Elizabeth. And it will be the overall quality of the answer that determined the mark, not the use of keywords or a mechanical marking scheme. But all that's very knowledge-based. But I would argue that this is knowledge that is enormously useful in being able to make sense of the world. Of the world. Knowledge isn't about mere facts. Uh, it, it, knowledge is about important concepts, from osmosis to the battles between executive and parliament, viruses versus bacteria, DNA, evolution, geopolitics. I also believe that a knowledge-rich curriculum improves cognitive skills, it increases vocabulary, and it provides a foundation for further study. Education also does involve some rote learning, multiplication tables, vocabulary in a foreign language, 
poems, the location of countries and their capitals and the climate. The changes to the national curriculum introduced in 2007 did enormous damage to the academic curriculum taught in state secondary schools, significantly reducing the knowledge content and replacing it with a range of so-called thinking skills. But as the American education academic E.D. Hirsch argues in his book, The Schools We Need and Why We Don't Have Them, the idea that a thinking skill in one domain can be readily and reliably transferred to other domains is a mirage. He also argues that the move away from knowledge widens the education gap between those from wealthier and poorer backgrounds, with the children from wealthier and better educated families having stronger cultural literacy as a result of their home life. And as knowledge builds on knowledge, this advantage widens exponentially unless schools are able to fill that gap. Over a longer period, the scholarship skills, such as essay writing and praising, have also been downgraded in state schools. The reforms to the curriculum introduced by this government have been designed to address these problems. It's not about equipping people to take part in pub quizzes. It's about ensuring that students are introduced to important subject knowledge to enable them to engage in further study of these subjects in the future, either formally or informally. And it's about ensuring pupils are reading more and are writing more. The English Baccalaureate was coined, first of all, uh, as a performance measure to assess how well a school is preparing its pupils for GCSEs in a range of core academic subjects namely English, maths, at least two of the sciences, a language and either history or geography. And the measure was designed to reverse the trend uh, towards softer or less academic subjects taking place in weaker comprehensive schools. It also introduced, uh, it was introduced to encourage more pupils to study a language through the GCSE, following a huge drop uh, in numbers after 2004, when it was no longer compulsory to study a language after the age of 14. In 1996, 50% of pupils were taking uh, that combination of GCSEs. I don't think that's a high enough figure, but it was 50% in 1996. By 2010, that had fallen to just 22%, with 16% achieving a C or above in the EBAC combination of GCSEs. As a result of the announcement of the new performance measure, a NatSEN survey shows that 47% will be taking the EBAC combination this summer. And I hope it rises beyond that figure in the future. The EBAC certificate is a different concept. This was to be the name of a reformed GCSE designed to eliminate unhealthy competition between exam boards for a share of the school exam market, and which over time has led to a lowering of standards. The proposal was to tender for one board to be awarded the exam for a particular EBAC subject. Now, a particular element of the reform has been dropped following a short consultation process because of concerns raised by Ofqual, the exam boards themselves, and worries over EU procurement rules. But the fundamental reform of GCSEs involving an end to modules and the reset culture and the introduction of more rigorous exams with, for example, more open-ended essay-style questions is proceeding. There also needs to be a significant reduction in the use of controlled assessment. All of these reforms are vital if we're to close the attainment gap between those from poorer and wealthier backgrounds, and if we're to ensure that school leaders and graduates are able to compete in the increasingly competitive global jobs market the majority of schools in the independent sector have continued to provide a traditional, knowledge-rich education, even as the public exams they prepare for uh, move towards a skills-based approach. I'm concerned about the increasing dominance of the alumni from this sector, not only in journalism uh, and, and in politics and in the law, but also now in the music industry. In the creative industries like film and television, with actors such as Dominic West, Eddie Redmayne, Damien Lewis, and others, all educated in the independent sector. 37% of medal winners in 2012 were educated in the independent sector, as were most of the England cricket team. So 
It's also becoming clear that many of the successful new businesses stem from entrepreneurs who were privately educated. People will argue this is about wealth and connections and school facilities, but I believe it, it demonstrates a truth that we've always known, that to get on in life, you need to be well educated. But the education establishment in the state sector, the education departments in our universities have allowed themselves to be dominated by an ideology that is simply failing to provide the type of education that the real world is demanding. Rigorous, academic, and knowledge rich. Challenging this ideology, I believe, is key to closing the education attainment gap between rich and poor and creating a fairer society. Thank you very much.